Hey there friends, Dave Flytus, K&M Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is the Bigfoot 101 class number nine. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's been quite a ride. I've read a lot of comments. And we're going to keep proceeding as we have done in trying to educate you along the lines that I educated myself. The theory behind this class is I want you to understand the progression I made in my thinking as I walked this path in Bigfoot. Now, I didn't go to one source. I went to multiple sources. I went to every source you could find. And I didn't really know what was credible at the beginning, but when I purchased Ray Crow's research, and this is what I did with it. It was called the track record. And the track record was a newsletter that he did for 17 years. 174 newsletters, 91 to 2007. 3,000 pages are in here. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Wildman, UFO reports. A variety of things and really what I did to raise research I wanted to make it last forever because in my garage I have 50 boxes that I purchased from Ray and in those boxes are all the newsletters the hard copy of the newsletters well if you didn't get one of those copies back during the time he was sending them out he never put them online. Ray wasn't somebody who really dealt much with the internet. But when I read them, I was riveted. And it was more the, the casual style that he put it together and the wide breadth that he had. Stories are from Australia, New Zealand, New England, England, Canada, US, South America. He had a big newsletter. And you wouldn't hear about it today unless I scanned all those pages and put them on this USB drive. To me, this was the biggest revelation in my re research because so many people contributed from around the world that weren't getting paid. And I'm going to go through some of the stories. This is just like one one thousandth of one percent of what I have still in my garage. What you're going to hear about today. I could probably sit here and read you those stories for the next 20 years for an hour every night. That's how many stories are in there. Now, as I read these, I had to put my thoughts into them as to real or unreal, credible or incredible. What would be the motivation for somebody to write this, draw this, send it to Ray, put it in a letter? And yes, they were put in a letter. These are letters. These are not emails. So this one was written in 94. And here's the letter. Dear Mr. Crow, I'm a game biologist in Oregon who is observing a herd of elk that is in a slow migratory stage. Anyway, to get to my point, the herd of elk has been seen moving a little faster to the eastern part of the Cascade Mountains, fairly close to the town of Sisters, Oregon. Now, if you remember and you've watched my missing persons videos, I've talked about Sisters, Oregon quite a bit regarding missing people. This herd is worrying me because this is unusual in their migration pattern. While there, I noticed large human tracks, but they were not wearing shoes. So I think that this animal is hanging to the elk pattern. The next day, 
I stared at four or five things I would like to call Bigfoot. Please keep in touch with me so we can communicate on this matter. I also drew what I saw. Game biologist, and, he saw, and this man signs it. No, I read that and I thought, no. But for that, folks, this is what he drew. That's stunning. So this game biologist, a professional game biologist, following these elk, sits down, writes a letter to Mr. Crow about what he sees. And he says, I'd like to call them a Bigfoot. Well, what else would they be if they were big and hairy and they were in a family group? This is the type of stuff that had me riveted. Because I'm sorry, I can't see somebody making this stuff up and going to that extent. Okay, there's an article that was in Ray's research. And the title was Sasquatch Mystery and Legend. Timid and shy, still retreating from the destructive forces of man. Perhaps they still walk the earth as they did one million years ago. It said by Richard Smedley. I have no idea where this article was came from, but it says it was 1975. Let me read this to you. I'm not going to read you all of it, but some of it is really good stuff. Seattle, Oregon. Robert Morgan, director of the American Yeti Expedition, has announced the discovery of human hair found in association with tremendous man-like footprints located in a remote area near Mount St. Helens. The hair has undergone microbiological analysis and has been certified human. It started with a search for the legendary Sasquatch or Bigfoot in the Northwest region of America. Morgan led a group of distinguished scientists and trackers through the heavily forested wilderness. As two of the trackers were crossing a stream, they noticed an extremely fresh scuff mark on a moss-covered rock. The hair samples were taken from that rock. The searchers reasoned that something apparently heard the trackers coming, coming and fled. It went upstream about 20 yards and then circled left above the trackers. Mary Jo Flory, a microbiologist in Portland, examined the hair and concluded it was of human origin from the lower extremities, probably a leg or ankle. It has been suggested that Sasquatch is some type of ape. Now Morgan says this hair could eventually lead to scientific proof Sasquatch is human. It was a Bigfoot, then it opens up many new doors. It might suggest a mutation in a previously unknown human evolutionary link. So, Friends, in my research, I came across this stuff all the time. Okay, so that's the article. I didn't make it up. What are all of these people that claim that they're professional academic types doing saying that it's an ape or a gorilla or an animal? How much proof do we need? Now, the next part of this article <laughs> floored me at the time I read it. And subsequent to my research about Yosemite National Park and my missing persons research, it floored me even harder. Here's what it says. In the great Yosemite Valley, the mist hangs against the mountains as if to hide visions of the past that time has not been able to obscure as it marches ever onward. It seems that if you only stare long enough and hard enough, you could perhaps perceive things that happened once long ago within the rock-bound valley. It was here within this valley near Bridalvale Falls that a party of miners discovered what was to become the mystery of the decade. The year was 1895, the month was July. While having lunch, Mr. G.F. Martindale, who was in charge of a party of miners, 
noticed a pile of stones that was placed against the wall of a cliff being familiar with the natural formation of rock. This particular grouping struck Mr. Martindale as being unusual and seemed not to have been placed naturally. Realizing that if something in the wild is not placed naturally, he could only conclude that it was placed there by human hands. The miners set about removing the pile of stones behind the pile. They found a wall of rock that had been shaped and joined together with knowledgeable masonry. The joints between the rocks were all of a uniform one eighth inch thickness and according to the reports of the men, there were a beautiful bit of stonework. As pretty as any wall on any building as I, I've ever seen is the way one miner described it. Thinking that they had perhaps stumbled upon some lost treasure, the party proceeded without delay and with much haste, tearing down the wall to get to the incredible riches that must be within it. Disappointment fell, a heavy weight upon their heads, as upon completion they found the vault empty, save a large mummified corpse which lay on a ledge carved from the natural stone for the expe express purpose of burial. Lighting their carbide headlamps, they set about examining the vault to see if perhaps they had overlooked something, perhaps a map or some other clue as to the inevitable treasure might be hidden. What they found was a vault that had been carved from natural rock, nine feet, three inches high, 18 feet, six inches deep, and eight feet, four inches wide, containing a mummified corpse that was six feet, eight inches long. Okay, you get that? It was a giant. The corpse was... <laughs> so I'm reading this. I'm thinking, as if Yosemite isn't strange enough from my research. In all of the research I've done on Yosemite, this is... This is outrageous. The corpse was wrapped in what appeared to be animal skins and covered with a layer of fine gray powder. The miners removed parts of the animal skins to view the corpse and found it to be that of a woman holding a child to her breast. The mummy was then taken to Los Angeles where it was placed before men of science, most of whom agreed that it was a relic of a race that must have inhabited the co this country long before the American Indian. All agreed that the height of six foot eight in death must have represented a height in life of 24, about seven or more feet. If their height relationship between men and women was approximately what it is today, then the males of the species would have been eight feet tall. The most popular theory of the day was that the lady was a relic of some royal family of lost Stone Age tribe. Captain Cook and Magellan both wrote in their ship logs of a race of giants that inhabited what we now know as the Pacific coast of South America. Captured one of the giants reportedly to be nine feet tall. Unfortunately, the giant escaped by breaking the ropes that bound him to the mast and jumped overboard. Cook wrote in his log that he himself was six feet two inches tall, which was very tall for those days when the average man was five feet four, and he could easily stand under the arm of the giant. Cook's report started a furor that was to last another hundred years and caused many of us to go seeking the giants. In the next century, many reports were f filed stating that various captains had sighted the giants of what then called Patagonia, but none made contact, or for that matter, even attempted to capture one of the giant men. Then suddenly, around 1650, the reports of the sighting giants along the coast stopped abruptly. Perhaps the giants moved in inland, perhaps because they moved far away, they could have just vanished. They could have simply become unpopular attractions and thus slipped gradually into oblivion. The fact remains that once they were there. The Yosemite Valley, where the mummy was found, has always been considered to be a place of great mystery by the Indians who live there. The, uh, you know, there's a Wani Lodge there. These are called the Awa Awanichis. Folklore of them relates a story of a giant who came into the valley long before white men arrived. The giant's name was Uellen. He was a vicious giant, for he liked to eat the Indians. He would catch the adults and carry them away to a hiding place near the foot of Cascade Falls. He would then cut the people into small pieces, hanging their meat in the sun to dry as jerky. The legend says that the Iwanis 
finally killed the giant and burned the body. This rules out the possibility that the giant mummy of Yosemite might have been Uellen. However, if there was a giant, where did he come from? Was there more than just one? Was there a female of the species? We may never know. All the Awanichis are dead, the last having died in 1947. <clears throat> the one thing about that tribe did leave a written record of their complex burial rites. These Indians usually burn their dead as they believe that by doing so, release the spirit of the deceased more quickly. The important part of the ritual and the relationship to the mummy of the Yosemite was that they always wrapped their dead in the skins of animals before they were burned. If you re recall, the mummy of the Yosemite was wrapped in the skins of animals and covered with fine gray powder. Ashes, perhaps? The scientists of the day, 1895, all agreed that the mummy predated the Christian era. It is therefore doubtful that the mummy was in any way connected with the Indians as they were believed to have settled in the valley at about 800 to 1,000 years ago. The Awanichis were also very small people, most being about five foot three. However, there have been traces of much earlier people that have inhabited the Southwest. The fact was pointed out dramatically in 1866 by a miner named Madison. No real discoveries have been made since that time by any other qualified archeologist because it was about that time the advent of mechanized mining began. Madison from Angels Camp, California, found a skull almost 130 feet underground in a shaft of his mine in Calaveras County. The discovery shook the foundations of Genesis itself. What intrigued Mr. Madison was why an Indian would dig a grave that deep in the ground when most were buried at about six feet. He knew the skull belonged to a very old Indian because it was fossilized and encrusted with some kind of gravel distinctive to the earth of that mine shaft. He took it to one of the bars in Angel's Camp on his next trip to town. Then he came across a doctor who told Madison that if it was an Indian, it was a deformed one. The doctor pointed out heavy, a heavy brow which ran across his eyes and nose. He pointed out several other differences in the cranium between this and other Indian skulls of more contemporary period, which occasionally dug up around the mining camps. The unknown doctor prevailed upon Madison to report the find to Mr. J.D. Whitney, a geologist for the state of California. Although Whitney knew nothing of the skull, he was an excellent geologist, and when shown the gravel-encrusted skull, he checked it with the gravel in its burial place and found the two to match. The skull had been found under four strata of lava, three strata of gold-bearing gravels. Thus, Whitney reported it probably had been buried near the end of the Pliocene, no, correct that, Pliocene era a million years earlier. Was it a human skull or was it the skull of some man-like creature that walked on California soil a million years ago? Indian lore tells us that there were creatures that ruled here long before the Indians came. According to some, they are still here, lurking unseen by all, but a few who have been lucky enough to spot a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Friends, you got to hang with me on these because there's a payoff at the end. And the people that stuck in there, you just got paid off. Uh, and then the article talks about the Osman uh, kidnapping that we've talked about before. And then uh, it talks about Roger Patterson and Gimlin. However, Patterson, a rancher from Yakima, Washington, attracted a great deal of attention when he was able to film a Sasquatch in action. Mr. Patterson, whose avocation has been researching the legend of Bigfoot, probably has the most complete collection of sightings in existence. The film was shot in October 1967. Shortly before it was taken, a friend and fellow Bigfoot enthusiast called Patterson to report tracks of Recent origin had been found in Bluff Creek. Patterson, accompanied by an expert tracker named Robert Gimlin, departed immediately for California. For the next week and a half, they scouted the area, watching for some signs of the elusive humanoid. Humanoid. On the afternoon of October 20th, they rounded a bend in the canyon, and Patterson's horse reared up. As he brought the frightened animal under control, he spotted a Bigfoot. 
about 125 feet across the creek. He said its head was human, although more slanted with a large forehead and broad nostrils. Its hair was two to four inches long, covered its entire body for the face and around the nose, mouth, and cheek. And it was a female. It had large pendulous breasts. It moved slowly across the sand. Barbara Patterson just had time to get out his motion picture camera and start shooting. Patterson next made plaster casts. Was a giant of the Awanichis a Sasquatch? If you recall, the mummy found in Yosemite was six feet, eight inches tall, which represents a height life of seven feet. Was the mummy a Sasquatch, or as the Sasquatches, the evolved ancestors of mutated ancestors of the mummy of Yosemite? Was the skull found in Calaveras County the forerunner of both of these species, one of which vanished completely and the other, forced to go back to its ancient ways of the forest hiding forever from man? Was it mankind who destroyed them both? The facts are there, and they are undeniable. The conclusions are a must, as always, be yours. Again, supposedly, I think this came from a magazine called Probe the Unknown, March of 75. Sasquatch Mystery and Legend, that's the title. So I threw a lot of things at you right there. Again, I know you guys and ladies are thinking people. So they found a skull deep underground, which they said was a million years old, based on what was on top of the skull. Well, that would throw anthropology a big loop, wouldn't it? And then they found a giant in a cave in Yosemite. Now, there's stories of these giants being found in various places of the United States. I wrote about them in my book, Bigfoot, Wild Men, and Giants. When I came across this article, that's the first time I had heard of this giant story in Yosemite. And I will bet anybody, big money, that the National Park Service does not have this anywhere in their history. And if you did a Freedom of Information Act on what the Park Service knew about this, they'd say, oh, we don't know anything about it. <laughs> because it doesn't fit with the history of the area that they want you to believe. It does get frustrating, admittedly, coming across these things from credible people. Robert Morgan was very credible, and his research was very good. So reading this, I'm not surprised, but we've got more good stuff to come. So this is uh, in 1995, February 6th. It's written from the Kansas Bigfoot Center. That was the name of it. Dear Ray, I found six tracks February 5th in the same place, Greenwood County, Kansas. They were just like the ones I found in November took photos of them and filmed, filmed them with my camcorder. Also tried to take two plaster casts of two of the tracks, but since they were in grass, they didn't come out too good. Also found some short, curly, white, gray hairs on the fence next to the tracks, but they might just be a deer. I collected them anyway and took them home. I've enclosed a drawing of the tracks I found. These are a little different. 13 inches six and a half inches wide. This is the track, three-toed. Very rare. Very rare. Not unheard of, but very rare. Kansas Bigfoot Center. Again, until I got some of this material, I'd never heard of any of these places. So Ray would get these reports and he'd write them up and he wrote this one up here it is Robert Windsor of West Lynn called after telling of a sighting Richard runs a reptile museum on Highway 26 at Boring Oregon and has a Bigfoot display on hand Robert works as a home loan mortgage broker and has been hunting his whole life and did not previously believe in Bigfoot 
Windsor was on October 3rd west of Crater Lake National Park in the Rogue River National Forest south of Union Creek. I know exactly where this is and I've been to this area and I've heard of a lot of strangeness in this area and when I was there on missing persons case I also heard of dozens of Bigfoot sightings in that area. On the second day of deer season at about 4,500 feet elevation, descending a dry slope at 5.30 to 6 p.m., about an hour before sunset, his partner 100 yards away, a dark figure was seen walking very briskly through the trees into an open area, behind some brush, and then out again. It walked in view about 15 seconds for a total of 40 to 50 yards. Unaware of Windsor, having been apparently flushed by his partner. It was about 70 yards away and he didn't shoot it because it was very human looking. <laughs> but knew it was a Bigfoot. It was hunched over, the head like a knob on top of the shoulders. The arms hung very low and swung in a fluid motion as it walked. There was no smell and it walked very quietly without snapping twigs, although the area was very dry. A key point right here. After you talk to hundreds of witnesses, many people have said, Dave, it was almost as though the Bigfoot was moving along and it appeared to be walking, but it's like its feet never touched the ground. It almost was gliding right above the ground. And you hear a lot of these things where yeah, it never snapped any twigs, logs, and it moved along and its head never bobbed. That was another thing I'd hear. The color was very dark, probably black, about six to seven feet tall, guessing 300 pounds. <clears throat> Windsor emphasized several times the fluid motion with walking and the swinging of the arms. It eventually moved off into a canyon. Windsor's companion saw nothing and neither oddly had seen any deer all day prior to that. Again, pretty common. Deer, deer would take off. They were camped a half mile away on a ridge along the forest road about two miles south southeast of Huckleberry Campground. Huckleberry Campground, why did that get its name? A lot of huckleberry bushes. It's between Grouse Creek and another creek to the east. And about 9 p.m., there were three instances in the next two nights on the edge of the meadow of the timber, they heard big limbs snapping 50 yards away in the trees. Big limbs. Not like elk moving. Lasted about 30 minutes or more and coming from two directions. Also near Whiskey Creek, about two miles away from camp, while hunting the slopes, there were several huge dung piles full of huckleberries on October 4th. The creature would have had a two-inch sphincter to leave droppings that huge, even too big for a large bear to pass easily. Did you get that? Now, when I was in Hoopa, I ran into some miners that told me of an instance where they were sleeping, and in the middle of the night, they actually hurt, felt, could feel the ground rumble as a something giant was coming towards them and they woke up in the morning and they said that there was a two foot long pile of feces two inches around that looked human and they said Dave there's no human that's gonna leave that and they said that I had only seen it once and thankfully, according to them, they never wanted to see it again. Back to the letter. At camp, telling partner Harry W. of Salem about the incident, he told of an incident 15 years ago around midnight near Bagby Hot Springs, east of Estacada, Oregon. There was a foul smell like urine soaked in rotten meat splashing in the creek and boulders rolling from upstream. The next day, he noted in the creek that the boulders were much too heavy for a human to move. Maybe a Bigfoot was eating crawdads, it says. And a follow-up call said that there was no fear seen by these people, although they didn't want to go back. The little things, 
human looking just the little things make these little notes in your head there's a man named uh, Jean Beckford uh, who was big in the Bigfoot scene right after the Patterson Gimlin footage was made and Beckford uh, quickly became a namesake in the Bigfoot world. He, he put himself as director of Project Bigfoot out of Seattle. And uh, there was an article that he wrote called A New Method for Calculating Sasquatch Weight. This is important because when you look at the Patterson-Gimlin film and the guesstimated height on that female Bigfoot was about six foot seven. Well, if you looked at it and you compared it to a human, you'd think it was about 400, 500 pounds. Well, the experts went in and they said, well, when that Bigfoot stepped on the sandbar and gravel in that area, its foot went down almost an inch. And when a human went by there, it hardly made an indentation. And therein lies a real dilemma in the Bigfoot world. So in the article that Beckyard wrote, and it was a good one, he guesstimated, based on his mathematics and talking to experts, From the calculations we have produced, rather large weights for the alleged Sasquatch of, the conservative estimate was it had to weigh at least 1,224 pounds. The mid-range estimate was 2,000 pounds. And the liberal high-end estimate was 3,600 pounds. Now, think about this. When you look at that Bigfoot on screen, it doesn't make sense that it should weigh 2,000 pounds. Even if you put it next to a human, if it's triple the size of me, I weigh 200 pounds, so it weighs 600 pounds. To think it weighs 2,000 pounds isn't logical because there's nothing about that compared to humans that would make it weigh that much. But this has come over time after time after time. And he went into, uh, I'll read you some of this. It says, therefore, since a conservative estimate and the mid-range estimate do not exceed the limits of proportionality for the several types of sandy soil quoted above, we may expect that these two estimates may be valid estimates. Since the mid-range figure is within the limits of proportionality for the settlement versus load relationship, since it is also based on the average of most noted depth measured at Bluff Creek, we suggest that the Sasquatch prints most likely to have been left by a creature or device that weighed 2,041 pounds. In order to verify these calculations and to determine accurately whether the method of calculation was alleged Sasquatch footprint loads is a correct method, we urge other investigators to perform load tests on a variety of soils. And that's been done. So the guesstimates on the Bigfoot at Bluff Creek, six foot six to seven feet tall. But the more important thing here is that the weight of the Sasquatch are out of kilter for our knowledge of human weight. And I do believe it weighs probably triple what we do, or quadruple in proportion. Maybe more. And when you read these analysis, you start to figure out, well, if it weighs that much, it can't be human 100%, can it? And it definitely doesn't walk like an animal. It walks like a human. So this is a report out of Kings County, uh, Washington. 
1997. It says a logging road that connects the county road with the warehouse or hall road from the watershed. We were walking with my hunting partner down the road trying to spot a grouse that we had just seen fly into the area of the swamp to the timber across the road from it. We're standing on the north side of the road looking up in the trees and trying to figure out how to get off the road in this dense underbrush to get a shot at that grouse. I got a funny feeling that something was watching us and we could smell something strong, kind of like a wet elk. The season was open too and that was basically why we were hunting. I turned around and walked to the other side of the road away from my partner and I looked in the swamp. Swamp. I didn't see anything at first, then I saw something very big move. It looked like the back of a bull elk, so I spun around and gave a loud whisper to my partner. By that time, he walked the half dozen steps or so from where he was to me, and the thing had stood up. I know it heard me, even though I know it was I was pretty quiet. It scared the heel out of me when it did this. I knew right there and then it wasn't an elk. As it stood up, it came from a position of squatting between its legs to a full stance. Just then, my partner saw it and remarked to me, what in the hell is that thing? I said, you ain't going to believe this, but that is a Bigfoot. My partner was worried about our safety and said, should we shoot it? Can we kill it? I said, I don't think so. We might be in big trouble with the law, and Joe had been there before. So we watched it for a few minutes. It was eating skunk cabbage leaves and roots. Stop there. I've heard that at least a dozen times that they eat this. It was very wary of us and kept rocking back and forth nervously. If we made any movements, it would duck its head a few inches and stare at us. Joe was worried about it attacking us. It made a posturing movement like it meant business. So I said, let's shoot it in the head and see if we can scare it off. So I said, let's shoot into, oh, not in the head. So I said, let's shoot into the road and see if we can scare it off. So we did, and it did. It took off like a bat out of hell in the direction away from us. Joe said, ain't nobody in hell going to believe us. They'll lock us up in the nut house if we do. We agreed right then and there to stay silent. This happened in the mid-80s, and I haven't said anything about it to anyone but the wife and kids and a few people I trust. Environment. The animal was standing along the edge of a swamp, only 10 feet from the road. We were in an area just above the power line right away. The area was next to a clear cut. There was a creek not far from there of an old abandoned coal mines. It made no noise except a grunt-like sound and a squeal when it took off. I am sure these things are animal, about eight feet tall or a little more. It probably weighed around 400 pounds. It had grayish colored hair that probably 12 inches long blackish colored face with lots of hair and almost no neck at all. Its arms extended below its knees. When it took off, it used its arms to propel it to speed and grabbed at the vine maples in front of them and swung. As for sex, I'd guess it was a male. I didn't see any breasts. It had so much hair between its legs that I could make out, I couldn't make out any sex organs. In closing, I can honestly say that they scared me. The thing is as powerful as a bull elk and could rip your arms off easily as their color could hide them in the woods. This is a very intelligent animal by its movements. It's no wonder you can hide. It's no wonder they can hide from man so easily. Their hearing is as good as a deer. I don't know about their sense of smell. I've had one other encounter that will add to this. My son Josh and I were prospecting at the top of a ridge on the south side of Lake Cachess, Cachess, K-A-C-H-E-S-S, three years ago when he came across Bigfoot tracks in the snow. We had driven to the end of a box canyon road, which is off of the lake, gated now. I wanted to explore the slide. The old road in that area is closed because of the slide, so we walked across the slide area and beyond. I'd heard from local residents that some bluish agates could be found just beyond the slide. We found them in some darkish colored rock, then walked beyond to an old clear cut. There were still snow drifts in the timber. By the time we had walked up along the timber, it was this area that I got spooked. I got a feeling something was watching us and looked around for tracks. Sure enough, about 50 feet into the timber, there were big tracks. It spooked Josh, and he said, who are those? I said, well, it looks like you're seeing the first Bigfoot tracks. 
I could tell they were four or five days old because the snow was melting and the tracks have sharp edges to them. You could see the toe marks though. I had a hard time believing this myself. So we followed them from the timber across the old clear cut and into the timber on the other side. At first I thought it was some clown with snowshoes in the shape of feet. But after following that far, I could tell from the depth of the tracks that this thing was heavy. I weigh almost 300 pounds. I could not imprint the snow that far. There you go. I'm trying to get this point across to you. They weigh a ton. The snow was pretty hard packed. My son was getting real uneasy, so we turned around and I went home. I've been a hunter most of my life, and this is the first time I've ever run into tracks like these. They were at least 18 inches long. The point being, these things are really heavy. <laughs> yeah, really heavy. Okay, Alaska. I have a really, really good friend, a uh, researcher, man named Rob Alley. Rob is one of the best researchers I know. He lived in Alaska for a long time. I've done a lot of conferences with him. And uh, Rob Alley sent this to Ray. It says, please feel free to publish these. Sasquatch Report, Southeast Alaska, 2006 interviews per Rob. Al Jackson, Claywalk, Alaska, reported on May 4th, 2006, that a girl he knew in Claywalk had been working with Claywalk Hatchery crew on a boat in May 2005 on Claywalk Lake. She and other crew members had related that she and the other crew had been working on a boat halfway up the west side of Claywalk Lake and saw a black tall figure swimming, then stand up out of the lake on the west side of Claywalk Lake near shore, not too far from the pens. Al detailed, at first they thought it was a bear, but the shoulders were too broad and it stood up and walked on two legs. I mentioned the report to the Claywalk hatchery manager in June 06, and he recollected the report, location, and date, but said he had not been there at the time and could not make any qualified comment. No evidence of tampering with the fingerlings was noted. Lawrence Craig, Alaska, reported in June 2006 that an acquaintance reported seeing a tall, brown-haired figure about seven feet tall standing beside the Heidelberg Highway, Prince of Wales Island, one night below the One Duck Creek area in March. I eventually interviewed the witness in September 2006, and he told me he'd been returning to Heidelberg by car after dark one night this spring when he caught sight of the figure. It was light brown colored, almost like a deer, he added, and it, sh and it sure watched me as I drove by. Also in 2006, a long-haul trucker reported hearing a series of three long hair raising howls at the Bell Irving rest stop near Meziadine Junction on Highway 37, Cassiar Highway. It had a strong sense of being watched, and in his years of hunting, he had never heard anything like them in his life, including wolf howls. The first call was seemingly a quarter mile away, and he unlocked his truck cab while he ate his dinner, or he locked his truck cab. He then decided to leave and was emptying the dinner remains into the outdoor garbage when he reportedly heard the last call approaching to within 300 yards. The first two calls were about 8 to 10 minutes apart. The last two calls were 3 to 4 minutes apart. And he described the calls as being exactly like the Ohio howl. Weather was slightly overcast, just above freezing. In June 1st, 2006, Nina Flurry Ketchikan reported to me that her aunt had been picking berries with her aunt one summer between 2001 and 2003 off the Claywalk Highway. She stated they were laughing while they were picking in a spot off by themselves, and several times they heard laughter from the forest in response to their laughing. Neither of them, though, said it could have been humans. There was nobody around. So what would be laughing? Do you know of any animal that could laugh and sound like a human? Right. A sighting near Juno was reported to me by Mrs. MC in Juno 2004. She related that while summer hiking with a friend that year, before she had seen something interesting at Excursion Inlet, they were hiking along a trail that paralleled one side of a creek valley running east-west about five miles north of the village of the Excursion Inlet. Enjoying good weather, she said, after hiking a mile or so up the trail and looking across Creek Valley, 
She said they noticed a tall, dark figure walking along the other side of the creek at their altitude. The witness said it was too tall for a human being, and it was the same dark color from head to toe. It just walked along with easy strides and swinging its arms. It didn't stop or seem to pay any attention to us at all. We watched it for about a minute. When asked for the distance, it appeared to be away from them. She replied, the distance would have been about three or 400 yards. She was quite clear that there were no other groups up the inlet without a boat. The forest is the second group mixed paralleling both sides of the valley. A Ketchikan teacher is reported by several co-workers and students as having an unusual photo of a black bear. Some have reported perhaps to be a Sasquatch, which I have yet to see. Again, this is Rob talking. A logger reportedly confidentially stated to Al Jackson that he had seen a large dark form, not a bear, he said, on the Heidelberg Road, Prince of Wales Island, apparently dragging itself by its arms from east to west across the road, somewhere between Trocadero Creek and Harris River. The alleged sighting took place in the early morning before dawn and had allegedly slowed down for it less than 75 yards away while at first unmoving in northbound lanes. Jackson said he said its front half and head looked like a man in form but heavier. Bed and breakfast owner operator Prince of Wales Island phoned me in June 2006 to report that five bear hunters staying with them at Whale Pass, Prince of Wales Island, had been hunting on Thorn Island when one of the men had reported seeing a seven-foot-plus light-colored figure walking on two legs up the beach from the forest. The man allegedly was looking at it through binoculars across the bay that he was hunting at and saw it from a good distance, but all five men were allegedly later to have seen it one of its tracks. 15 inches long on the beach at the spot the figure had walked into the woods. He was a bit shook up, the owner told me, and didn't want to talk about much about it later. No interview was given. A man reported to me in June 06 that while family camping several summers previously at Eek Inlet, E-E-K, South Prince of Wales Island, south of Heidelberg, he and his family had heard screams coming from Eek Lake, northwest of Eek Inlet. Way too loud to be a person, it was said. Uh, another one individual reported to me in 06 that previous summer he had conducted a bus tour behind Little Rats Harbor, Prince of Wales Island, and had been calling collared wolves with a wolf biologist. And after the third call, the howl vocalization, vocalization answered that according later, the biologist said, wasn't a wolf. Heidelberg, another individual in Heidelberg reported in July 06 that late one night, two years previously, she had been driving a, loud, a load of sleeping passengers coming from Trocadero to Heidelberg, and a running figure appeared by the driver's window with a human-like face. Human-like. A man from Portland, an experienced professional fishing guide who works summers at Misty Fjords, reported on August 20th, 06, that he had glimpsed what he thought looked like a Sasquatch through binoculars in Misty Fords in 87. In an interview with me on board the Alaskan ferry, the Prince of Wales Island, he related the following, quote, I was working in Misty Fjords at the lodge as a fishing guide in the spring summer that year, as usual, and was working out of Mink Bay. One morning in May, around 6.15 in the morning, I was in a 30-foot boat just idling south down mink arm with a couple of tourists in the cabin below. Mistake. Let me tell you. I've cruised in some of these little fjords and things in a boat, ship. Do not. <laughs> do not be down in your cabin. You be up on deck. The amount of things you will see will blow your mind. I was looking for bears on the west shore of the big with the big Swarovski high power binoculars scanning the bench 20 feet above the beach, just where the salmonberry bushes come down to the beach grass. Salmonberries, pay attention. I saw something that moved that stopped in the in a patch of a bush and was being pushed aside and showed a dark skinned face with real long dark hair coming dark down to the shoulder height. It was staring at me or the boat and there were dark hands on either side of the face holding the bushes away from the head. It was at least man-sized. The head seemed about six feet off the ground. I'd say it was standing about 25 yards from shore, maybe 20 feet above the water. And the shore was about 65 yards from me, pretty sharp on the binoculars. No time to call clients. 
but anybody looking can tell it wasn't a brown or black bear. The face had eyes that were dark, but not too small. The face just stared at me in the boat for a couple of seconds and then let go of the bushes and was gone. I spent a good bit of time looking at wildlife and I've never seen anything like it before or since. He added that another guy he worked with who camped out on the beach in Misty every summer had later confided in him that guaranteed there was some pretty unusual stuff out there, but that the other guy wasn't at all talkative type and neither of the men wanted any publicity. He said he didn't push the other guy for details. When I asked him to select the appearance of the face using a prehistoric hominid identikit, Raincoat Sasquatch, the guide immediately selected figure 50, a reconstruction of Gigantopithecus with one provision. The only change he would make, he added, would be to make the hair much longer, kind of like a way hippies used to wear a shoulder length. The sighting was reported as occurring approximately halfway down the arm of the watch. This is the second account I have of a Sasquatch reported behaving in this way in Mink Bay. In May 2000, or in 2000, Mrs. K.B. Ketchikan, in Ketchikan, now 28, confidentially recounted, my mother told me several years ago that around 1980, she and my father were sport trolling for salmon in Mink Bay. Dad was at the wheel of the boat looking ahead, but my mom was watching the shore, which was only about 50 feet away. Mom said that for just a few seconds, she saw bushes part by black, hairy arms and hands and watched a tall, heavily built man-like creature staring at the boat. She said it was definitely not a bear and had a face more like a man. What she insisted was that for several seconds, she and the creature made eye contact. She said that dad didn't see it. He was looking the other way. I believe she was telling me exactly what she had seen. No month or time of day was given. Was it possibly the same Sasquatch that was reported walking along the shore in 79 at the head of Hidden Inlet, 13 miles east of Mink Bay, then stopping to stare at him 10 seconds while sighted along with his rifle barrel? Don't know. Claywalk, reported in July 06, was on a hunting trip with a friend on the roads of the behind Kassan Mountain, fall 2004, when he saw a Sasquatch. It was dark and my partner and I were driving a logging road back to our camping spot when I saw these eyes in the bush shining red. I turned in the rig so that the lights were on him. It seemed tall for a bear and he jumped into a tree. It didn't climb like a bear and it never went down on all fours. The thing was at least as big as a man. When it went up, it went the far side of the tree, but after going up 15 feet or so, it kept darting its head around the side of the tree to look at us. So here's the tree, like this. The strangest thing was its eyes. They were large and reflected red in light. It showed whichever way it was looking. It was really rolling its eyes around at us. Pretty amazing. We never heard it make any sound. After a while, we were getting tired of playing peekaboo with it out after dark. And the moment we both turned to look around at the same time, it took off back into thick timber. This is the only one I've actually seen. Thanks to Rob Alley for those. And Rob, at the time, had written to Ray Crow and let, let Ray put that in his newsletter. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. I can tell you folks that the more I read of this stuff, as I get reminded on what I read, it's unbelievable. So this is actually a reporter from a newspaper writing to Ray in 1976. Actually, he wrote a letter to uh, Peter Byrne, Bigfoot Information Center in Dallas. And was, I have the actual letter. Peter gave all of his letters to Ray. It says, uh, gentlemen, I've just finished reading a book entitled Bigfoot, written by Ann B. Slate and Helen Berry. I'm gratefully interested in the Bigfoot phenomenon and UFOs. This has prompted me to write to your organization. I'm a firm believer in the existence of UFOs and creatures such as Bigfoot. While I have not seen a Bigfoot personally, I feel such a creature must exist based on the sightings of responsible people such as those mentioned in the book. I also do not believe this planet Earth has a franchise of humanoid life. As far as UFOs are concerned, I have, like thousands of other people, seen weird objects in the atmosphere on a couple of occasions. 
the latest being at approximately 11.30 p.m. on August 15th. A bright light at considerable height moving at a fantastic rate of speed horizontally across the night sky. It changed directions a number of times, stopped twice, and finally disappeared from view, again at tremendous rate of speed. A person doesn't usually bring these matters up in conversation with other people for fear of ridicule. Three years ago, in the nearby community of Balcaras, there were a number of UFO sightings and some were photographed. I saw two of these photographs shown to me by an officer of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who said that he had taken the photos himself. UFO sightings in Balcaras, Saskatchewan, lasted throughout the summer and the police often among the sighters. Police said the objects would hover 100 feet above the grounds, town, streets, as if they were watching what was going on in the community. The objects were either cigar-shaped or looked like two plates put together with flashing lights, red, green, and yellow. They emitted an eerie humming noise or a high whine. Nobody reported seeing any creatures. A few miles straight out of town of Balcaras, there is the beautiful old Cuapel Valley, a deep cleft of the prairie about a mile or two miles across. This valley cuts across the south and south central parts of Saskatchewan from west to east and features a number of deep lakes. About 40 or 50 miles east of Balcaras lies the tiny community of Dubuc. The valley is about 10 to 15 miles south of the community. The Dubuc area there several years ago, sightings of strange creepy lights glowing and flashing. The natives of the area attributed the lights to gases, the unusual response. The lights have not apparently been seen for a few years. It is not my intention to begin a frenzy about UFOs, Bigfoot creatures, etc. And I would just as soon not see this type of information published to any great extent, but it is very, very interesting. I have frequently driven to the valley at night, but have never seen either lights, UFOs, or Bigfoot. Still, the geographical makeup of the valley, coupled with the sightings of UFOs in the area three years ago, leads me to believe that there could well be some activity in the valley. As I mentioned before, my interest in these occurrences have prompted me to write to you, and I do have a favor to ask. I understand that your organization publishes a regular newsletter, as well as frequent other publications I'd appreciate being put on your list. Newspaper, Saskatchewan. And that, I think, is fascinating stuff. Again, this is a letter to Peter Byrne, dated September 24, 75. In line with your research on Bigfoot, I've been meaning to write to you for some time, provide you with some more information, sightings on the Yakima Indian Reservation. I'm telling you, friends, Indian reservations and Bigfoot and UFOs all go together. However, we have been involved with quite intensive UFO research on the reservation, along with my normal duties. I've just about been able to keep up. You may not be aware the reservation has been in an area of heavy UFO activity during 72 and part of 73. It had the most intensive UFO activity of any area in North America. Pay attention. Dr. Heineck assigned an investigator here and the Yakima Indian people. The Tribal Council and Branch of Forestry have all been unofficially working together on the thing. Some of the occurrences have been almost mind-boggling. However, this year has been outstanding by its lack of activity. At least it's given me a chance to catch up on some of my personal things as well as pulling a few of the Bigfoot incidences together that have come from my attention. Incidentally, you may have read some of the activity in the January issue of Saga magazine. I've listed some of these Bigfoot incidences separately. I hope you'll overlook the typing mistakes, but I was a little bit of a hurry. My fingers didn't always hit the keys and brain cells tell them. And again, friends, you got to remember, 75, all these letters are typed. It took somebody a lot of time. One problem with Bigfoot sightings is the Indian people are very reluctant to disclose or talk about them. This is particularly true of the older people. It has something to do with some of the tribal beliefs regarding some creatures. And then, of course, there is the normal reluctance one finds among people be because of fear of ridicule. So I feel safe in saying the number of Bigfoot encounters on the re reservation have been many, many times more than just the ones which have come to your attention. For instance, I've been told a number of encounters with such creatures in the canyons of the Mule Dry and Dry Creek areas in past years. Strangely, this is within the same areas where UFO activity has been the heaviest. 
Wake up out there. I'm going to read this again. Pay attention. For instance, I have been told about a number of encounters with such creatures in the canyons of the Mule Dry and Dry Creek areas in past years. Strangely, this is within the same areas with our UFO activity has been the heaviest. Are you aware of the Bigfoot activity which is supposed to regularly occur in the North and South Fork areas of Anthonym Creek? This is above Tampico, Washington, west of Yakima. Many stories have come to me and others from the area along with such statements that at times the people can smell them of sheep they've lost, etc. However, I've also been told that because of pre previous ridicule, the residents have quit talking about the incidents when they do occur. This is an area where Roger Patterson lived and where his widow still resides. There's also something inter interesting which I've come across, and I've been wondering if you have seen any of the travels in this general area. I've received numerous reports of a species of large ostrich-like birds living in the vicinity of Mount Adams on the reservation. Numerous persons have seen them, but what bothers me is I don't remember ever hearing or reading anything about such birds being native to this area. One observer said that while observing one standing on the opposite side of a five to six foot, seeing a five to six foot, the bird's head was above the treetop. They leave quite a large three-toed type of bird track. I suppose I should write to WSU about the possible information. Hope you're able to derive some information from the material I've enclosed. If you have any questions, do not hesitate. W.J. Vogel, Staff Crime, correct that, Staff Fire Control Officer, Yakima Indian Reservation, Topanish, Washington. A very, very credible man. So this is what he wrote, typed it all out. Bigfoot activities on the Yakima Indian Reservation, which have been brought to my attention. In about 63, a woman who lived in Southeast Topanosh at the base of Topanosh Ridge was sitting in her living room reading late one evening. Her husband was asleep on the Davenport. She suddenly got a strange feeling that something or someone was looking at her. She glanced over at her window and there was a large monkey-like face with red eyes peering in at her. She screamed and her husband jumped off the Davenport and upon hearing a reason for the scream, took his gun and ran outside. The creature was gone, but his tracks were seen leading from the window across the yard up into the hills. Story two, it's filtered back to me that a teacher in White Swan, Washington, now believed to be Hera, Washington, has some pictures of Bigfoot tracks in the hills to the west of White Swan. Story three, in 71 or 72, a friend was proceeding along a road in the hills west of Fort Simcoe, Washington. While somewhat under the influence of John Barleycorn, they still were in control of their senses and they came into an opening they observed ahead of them two large hairy ape-like creatures. They said one to be a male and one a female. The female was dragging what to be, appeared to be an old blanket. As soon as the creatures approached the, another vehicle, they actually moved into the timber at the edge of the opening and disappeared. The two men were quite frank and frightened and looked up and sobered up by their encounter in reverse directions and sped to White Swan to tell their story. Where they had been drinking, their story was met with only skepticism and sneers. Their attitude, even though the men were obviously frightened, they couldn't get anyone to return to the area with them. Yeah, uh, I tend to believe that. In 71 or 72, it was reported that a group of high school kids were on a camp out northwest of Goldendale, Washington, near an area called Kaiser Butte. As it got dusk, one of the girls wandered slightly away from camp and she passed a large tree. A large creature, ape-like, grabbed her. Her screams brought her classmates on the run, but she was able to squirm out of her coat and get away. The creature disappeared into the woods. Story five, a Johnny Johnson of White Swan was reported to have come across some large five-toed tracks in Topanish Canyon, year unknown, the maker of the tracks and eventually and have evidently been hurt as a toe was missing on one foot and the tracks made that foot were bloody. In 73, two couples were camped at McCormick Meadows near a marshy area and in the middle of the night they were awakened by the sound of someone or something approaching through the marsh. Waiting, they thought it might be someone coming for help for a disabled vehicle or something. However, whatever it was went right on past their tents and they could tell by the sound of them walking. It was a heavy creature. 
The sound of the steps were definitely made by a two-footed creature. They didn't attempt to locate the tracks, but left the area. Probably a smart move. 73 or 74, just after dark, two Indian young men stopped at a location known as Vassy Springs to answer a call in nature. As they were standing beside their pickup, they heard something running towards them from down the road. The footsteps were quite heavy and definitely bipedal and coming quite fast. Becoming frightened, they hastened into their pickup. As they sped away, they could hear the footsteps almost to the rear of the truck. And they were quite shaken by the experience. They did see a large, hairy, bipedal creature. 72 or 73, a local Indian rancher was camped for the night with his dogs near an area called Camas, C-A-M-A-S, Patch, in the dry, loggy area. As he was sitting beside his campfire, his dog suddenly rushed barking off into the dark woods. Shortly, they came back to camp, sh shakenly crowded up against Mr. Phillips. The dogs were apparently very frightened and made no sound as they crouched, quivering at his feet. Suddenly, Mr. Phillips was aware of a large hairy thing standing at the edge of the campfire. The creature was about seven feet tall and gave off a terrific stench. It just stood there for approximately a minute and a half, looking at the man and the dogs. It then turned and left, and as you could hear it moving off through the woods. Being himself badly shaken now, Mr. Phillips immediately broke camp and returned to the valley. He said the stench was overpowering, and it was for several days before it left his nostrils. And he stated, he goes, I believe this is one of the outstanding sightings of a Bigfoot on the reservation. Story nine. Later, last year, a couple who have spent many hours camped out on Cattlemen were camped out in the Smith Springs area of the reservation. This is near Camas Patch area. They were awakened by the sound which they said they had never heard before, like one might hear from a coyote or cougar. They described it as hair raising. They said it was a sort of crying, growling, and seemed to circle their camp. Ever being hardened outdoorsmen, they were frightened and upset. Story 10. One night early in June of this year, a rancher with whom I'm acquainted and who lives in the base of Topanish Ridge was, along with his wife, awakened by a strange cry from the back of their place. It didn't sound like anything they'd ever heard before, like a cougar or a coyote. I gave them a tape recording to play, which I have sounds made by a Bigfoot back in Pennsylvania. They said that was as near as they could tell to the static in the background on the tape, and it was the same sound. At least they said it was closer to that sound than anything else they know. In the mid-60s, an area north of White Swan, an experienced period of sheep and dog killings, which could not be accounted for. One man, a deputy sheriff who lives in an isolated ranch, had clothes taken from his clothesline and a number of puppies brutally slain. He also lost several grown dogs in the same manner. It was not done by coyotes. Several sheep in the area were also slain while their flocks, and this was done by coyotes. Next story, most Indian legends are based on some fact or factual incident. The Yakimas have a legend about a large man with red eyes who came to live with the tribe. A large man with red eyes. Whenever any of the Indian people became sick, he would heal them. However, one day he knew he was dying and asked the Indian people to take him to a particular spot or location so that he might be there when he died. They did. Shortly after he died, a large flying object came down from the skies, put his body aboard, and flew off into the sky. I can't make this stuff up, folks. <laughs> Come on. I can't make it up. One of the fire guards told me that some years back, he is in his early 40s, he was riding horseback in the hills, rounding up cattle, and came across these strange, large, man-like tracks. He decided to follow them and eventually caught sight of something that was large and definitely not a man. As he was by himself, he decided right then to forget the whole thing and quit following it. Next story, one of the foresters reported in 73 concerning an incident which happened to him while he was walking through one of our timbered areas in preparation for a sale. He was followed by something for a distance of three miles. When he would stop, he could hear it behind him. He then tried circling, but he couldn't get a look of what it was. He convinced myself, he convinced himself it was a cow or something like that, but he admitted that the animal don't normally do that, and particularly not stop as soon as he did every time. Of course, there was a possibility that it might have been a cougar, as they will follow a man for miles. They are quiet and don't usually, even, this creature cause rocks to roll, twigs to snap, etc. Next story. 
The Yakima people have a legend which they refer to as the Stick Indians. Whenever something occurs while they are in the woods, such as dis things disappearing, tent getting knocked down, etc., they attribute it to the Stick Indians. Any number have been reported sleeping in the woods and waking up during the night with objects standing beside them. As soon as they do, much stirring, the Stick Indians fade into the darkness. Last story. An Indian family who lived several miles from the incident mentioned in Number One Observed, an ape-like thing shulking around her backyard one night in 72 or 73. When they went out into the yard with guns and lights, it fled into the hills. Friends, I got boxes of this stuff. To me, it's stunning. I hope, I hope you found it interesting. Every time I read this stuff, I learn more. I, I, re, I retain more. And that's why I truly believe that the Native Americans know much more than what our media is telling us. And our media doesn't want to play this because it doesn't fit their role of what they think a Bigfoot is. But we'll keep walking this path. I'll keep explaining to you what I've learned. And uh, hopefully we'll become enlightened together. Thanks for being here. Remember, I post twice a week new segments about missing people. And uh, I have about 400 videos on our site. If you look right below, below the picture frame of what you're watching, click on videos. It'll take you to all of our videos. You can follow me on Twitter at David Politis at Can Am Missing. And I'm also on Truth Social. Our website, nabigfootsearch.com. If you go to the store, you find all of our things, books, etc. Thanks for being here. See you soon. Politis out.